Welcome to Unit 6, Ethics, Economics, and the Environment. This is the final lecture of the Introduction to Environmental Science, selection number 24. Uh, change the title of it, like that. <laughs> Got rid of whatever that was, Law, Government, Society, and decided to come up with something much better, <laughs> uh, Sustainable Economics and Sustainable Environment. Uh, if you're wondering what that uh, image is behind that title, well, we'll get to that in just a minute. Be patient. So for this lecture, we're talking about what is environmental sustainability. It's not as though we haven't talked about this in the past in this particular course. Amendment 1, Florida's Water and Land Conservation Initiative. Trade-offs. Is it the economy versus the environment? Or maybe the economy and the environment? Hmm. What's wrong with economics? You didn't know there's anything wrong with them. Well, there's some things that economics needs to consider, which it does not. The value of learning about the natural world. How do we reduce our impacts? A wee bit about sustainable development. And a very brief course review to kind of show you where we've been. Very briefly. So, bamboo. That's what the stuff is. That picture behind that title slide. Is it environmentally sustainable? A green, friendly building product? or not. Well, this came about because uh, considering, or a year or so ago, was considering replacing the carpet in our living room with hardwood. And uh, so I found out of this stuff, this uh, actually flooring that's made of bamboo. And I'm thinking, hey, that sounds great um, because bamboo is all the sustainable stuff going on. But then I started doing some research and finding out, is it really sustainable? So two points of view. First one is, no, it is not, called the Goodwood Blog, uh, and there's a link to the Goodwood Blog right there in that uh, particular uh, sort of you can see it. First of all, the first point of the Goodwood Blog is that this is not a native species. It's manufactured. Manufactured crops devastate biodiversity. In other words, like growing corn or growing pine trees, it's a monoculture. It's not carbon friendly. We'll go into more on that later. You'd think, wow. It grows fast, it's a plant, it takes carbon out of the atmosphere, how could it not be carbon friendly? Well, these guys make an argument that it's not. Its lead credits, which is a type of building certification, are not robust. Uh, in other words, the, uh, the, the company or the, the group that, that certifies buildings as being energy uh, efficient, uh, having an energy efficient design, that's what uh, that stands for, they don't necessarily find bamboo to be all that worthwhile and it lacks integrity. I'm not talking about its character, I'm talking about uh, in this case what they're talking about is where it is manufactured lacks integrity. So well, on the other hand maybe it is. It's another blog called Tree Hugger and you can get to Tree Hugger right there. Tree Hugger sustainable product design bamboo flooring really green we still don't know. Um, what could be greener than bamboo? Bamboo is grows fast, takes carbon out of the atmosphere, um, it just does not take up, it, it, it is not displacing other species, it's, it's great. Well, it sort of does, but anyway. It grows fast, and it makes pandas happy. Yeah, pandas happy. So, bamboo. So from the positive side of things, the tree hugger side of things, what could be greener? Well, it's not as green as it could be because of where it's grown primarily for uh, the purpose of, and, and the case I was going to use it for, uh, putting down uh, hardwood flooring. It's not grown in this hemisphere for that purpose. Who you choose to provide it is very important. That's where the integrity issue comes in. Comes in. What quality of product are you getting? There is no widespread replacement of natural force with bamboo in Asia. That just simply does not happen, even though the claim is well, here we're taking away the food of the giant panda. Well, they're not growing these uh, these forests, these bamboo forests for uh, manufacturing, if you will, for, for building the, the hardwood out of, uh, in areas where that, that are actually giant panda habitat. And another argument, not much of the forest in China has been natural for thousands of years. So you're not really impacting 
a natural forest, certainly not an old growth forest in China because there are, just aren't that many of them. Now, it does grow fast. That is a very positive thing. It can grow in uh, uh, very few years, seven years, you can have a, a mature bamboo forest ready to be harvested. But it is not a hardwood. It is not like quarter cut oak. Uh, I used to have a, a hardwood floor uh, in an old house uh, in another state uh, that was made out of quarter cut oak. You can't find that stuff anymore because they cut down all those trees. It's very highly processed. They uh, uh, compress it, they use a great deal of machinery to make it uh, much more dense than you know the bamboo you know and I know. Third, band bamboo does make pandas happy and that's true. Bamboo flooring is not taking food away from those endangered species because the pandas don't live where the industrial harvest of bamboo is happening. Alright, so non-environmentally sustainable green building product. This is the Goodwood Blog's point of view. It's not a native species. That's very true. Well, it's not a native species in the United States. It's a native species in Asia. To truly be sustainable, we need to utilize natural renewable resources approximately where they are growing. In the U.S., bamboo is considered an invasive species. Indeed, it is, in places, taking over. Bamboo, where it's in an invasive role, devastates biodiversity. It's a strong word, but certainly damages it if you're replacing a natural forest with it. Very quick life cycle, which we think would lead to its greenness, but in three to seven years, it would take three to seven years to fully mature and harden, versus a natural hardwood forest, those oak forests uh, that we'd like to, to see and we would like to, to make things out of, take hundreds of years to mature, particularly if you're going to get to something as nice as that quarter cut oak was. Boy, I miss that stuff, anyway. It's grown in monoculture stands, not in natural forest. That's a, that's a true statement, so is pine. Look at pine trees, they're grown in the same manner, so I, that one I don't buy much. But that quick turnaround time and monoculture increases soil loss. You go back, you remember the assignment about uh, uh, the uh, uh, certain uh, uh, how long it takes to, to form an inch of soil. Well, that monoculture increases that soil. You don't have time to make soil. It's not carbon friendly, according to these guys, and these are some good points. A native forest will store more carbon than a bamboo forest that replaces it. Bamboo products have to be replaced more frequently. They're not as durable as oak or hickory or those sorts of things. The really damaging part, if I can get that highlighted work there, is that most of the bamboo products are basically the bamboo is cut on the other side of the world and put on ships and shipped to us. A lot of carbon is used in that, and there was a lot of fuel is used to actually get those bamboo products from the other side of the world here to where we're actually using them. And then this idea of bamboo lacking integrity, say that right. Bamboo is harvested and processed, said on the other side of the world. Quality control is difficult. You can't guarantee the type of uh, who is actually in charge of your bamboo, if you will, of that floor. This goes back to the idea of pick your suppliers carefully. So is there a use for it? Back to that bamboo forest. This is actually a new world bamboo forest in my backyard. <laughs> Pulp and paper production. That is one of the positive things about that you can use bamboo for. Many benefits using non-wood fiber for pulp and paper. In other words, using bamboo for that. It is, in terms of the pulp and paper industry, carbon neutral. And it costs less to use than wood pulp and you don't lose that much carbon. And another point of view on it is Bio Global Investments Group LLC. That's a hot link. 2014, the voters of Florida passed Amendment 1, which is the Florida Water and Land Conservation Initiative. Now we've had these initiatives for many, many years. I think uh, uh, since uh, the, the late 1980s, uh, early 1990s, uh, one of the governors of Florida uh, put, these, uh, put this in place so we could protect the lands that we have, recognizing the importance of having wild lands, wilderness lands, 
to overall protection of what attracts people to Florida in the first place, which is our gorgeous environment, really, not just about the sun. So this constitutional amendment approved by more than 75% of the vote. You don't normally get those sorts of numbers. It was beyond the slam dunk. It was way up there. Only 66%, I think, had to pass it. 75% did, so it's definitely in place. It was designed, designed being the key word there, to dedicate a third of the net revenue from dock stamp taxes. Basically, every time a, 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 a house is sold or a large piece of property or something like that happens, a certain amount of the proceeds to that, there's a tax on that, and that goes to support a variety of things in the state government. And one of those is the Land Acquisition Trust Fund. The Land Acquisition Trust Fund has been a part of that for decades. Um, but for most of that time, it's been 10% or less of the dock stamp revenue. Now, uh, the 33% uh, the of that dock stamp revenue goes to the Land Acquisition Trust Fund, which is where the Florida Water Land Conservation Amendment initiative is, uh, is doing its work. That's the money. So this land acquisition trust fund was developed to acquire and improve all these things, conservation easements, wetland, forest, fish and wildlife habitat, beaches, shores, recreation, urban open space, rural landscapes, and some other things too. It was also developed to acquire and improve working farms and ranches, historical geologic sites, lands protecting drinking water and water resources, watersheds essentially. And those in the EAA, Everglades Agricultural Area, and those lands upstream from Lake Okeechobee. It's called the Everglades Protection Area, but essentially it's the <laughs> Lake Okeechobee watershed. Some of the work that is done in more rural parts of Florida, Highlands County being one of those, receives funding from this Everglades Protection Area Fund, uh, or the funding that comes through the, the uh, this land acquisition trust fund. So that's a very important aspect of restoration uh, projects in uh, this part of Central Florida. Basically, the land acquisition trust fund was designed to manage and restore natural systems and to enhance public access and recreational use of those conservation lands. So here's a, a, some numbers. Uh, it's pretty robust. The first year, they estimated it was going to bring in an additional, or I guess it's a per year basis, $648 million in the first fiscal year, uh, which was 2015. Um, and it was going to grow double over the next 20 years, so $1.26 billion per year in 20 years. So more information on that is available through that little hot link right there. The Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation wanted to see where the money was going. They were interested because, well, it was, the potential was there, $600 million a year, to spend buying land. And that will buy some land even in Florida. 2015, the state legislature, according to the work done by the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, diverted, did not send those funds from the Land Acquisition Trust Fund to those intended uses. Instead, it diverted them to these rather side uses, $1.2 million to risk management insurance for these agencies, DEP and DAX, uh, covering liability, civil rights violations, those sorts of things. $623,000 to Executive Leadership and Administrative Services for Fish and Wildlife and $21 million, once again back to Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, for implementation of Ag BMPs, Best Management Practices, on non-conservation privately owned lands. So active farms were diverted, they got $21 million of this $600 million pot. A few other things. $174,000 I'm sorry, $174 million went to salaries and overhead, DAX, DEP, FWC, and Department of State. Quite a few of the salaries, uh, a bit of the salary money came from this uh, Amendment 1 uh, land trust fund. $838,000 for wildfire suppression vehicles for DAX. Firefighting equipment. 
Well, okay. $5 million to DAX to pay operators to keep pollution on their own land. $38 million to DEP to assist in building stormwater treatment systems. Again, this is not procurement of land or protection of those things that are outlined uh, in the fund, but that's what this is used for. So that totals up to a whopping $237 million and change. It's a lot of change. So what happened to the rest of it? I'm not sure. I hope that it went actually to conservation acquisition. It's a rerun from a previous slide, uh, previous lecture back, uh, I think this is unit two, but we're talking about the trade-off between the economy and the environment. Growing number of economists assert that environmental protection enhances the economy. Certainly we're gonna make that point a few more times. Essentially what we have here is a strip mine, a coal mine, that's been uh, where a mountain has been completely ground down. And that enhancement in the economy depends upon how long a term of view you have of the economy. Short term, years to decades, which we don't plan usually beyond a very short period of time, shorter than that. The resource extraction, coal mining in this case, may be profitable, but in the long term, you've lost that natural resource. You need to think about replacing those things. So we're looking at economics, the environment, and the term sustainability. Sustainability is something introduced very early on, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. So in economic systems, a system like a, a business, economics, your economists, seek to answer three questions. What, how, and for whom a commodity should be produced? Why do you produce this commodity? Is there someone to buy it? There's no point in making this thing, but going to buy it. We go through this all the time. Two different, I guess, scales of economics. Microeconomics is actually economic behavior of individuals and households and businesses, uh, those sorts of things, where it is more like balancing the checkbook or where you're going to invest your individual money. Macro, much larger scale. Performance, structure, and behavior of larger economies. That's really, well, they both can fit in with the environmental aspect of things, but really when we talk about the economic side, we're trying to influence how macroeconomics are designed so they can trickle down to the local or micro level. So what are some environmental considerations? There's this law of supply and demand. You're probably familiar with it. Uh, so law of supply and demand. Price is the main thing that controls, main governor if you will, behavior in a market economy. Largely determined by how much of a certain thing is and how great the demand is for it. So if you have something that is high demand and the uh, supply of it is, is, is small, the price is going to go up. Or if it's difficult to make, the price is going to go up. All those sorts of things because of the high demand. On the other hand, you may, it might not work that way. You might have a, a, a lot of uh, supply and very little demand trying to get rid of it. So you have discounts, so to speak. Market price point at which supply and demand curves intersect represents the price compromise between the producers. Hey, how much will you give me? How much can I possibly take for this and not lose my shirt? And consumers saying, I can't afford that. It's going to cost me my shirt. That sort of a thing. So that's that compromise that we come to through the marketplace. Serious implications of the environment if this supply, law of supply and demand fails to take into account the fact that it's not infinite Natural resources are finite. We are going to run out of particularly those, those uh, uh, non-renewable natural resources. And if we contaminate our water, then we have another uh, essentially non-renewable resource because we can't afford to fix it. Only considering supply and demand can spawn a lot of wasteful and unsustainable practices like dumping raw sewage directly into rivers and lakes. That's unsustainable. A recent example of supply and demand, this is a 2016 model Prius 2E, uh, combined city highway mileage of 55 miles per gallon. Uh, if you're careful, you can do better than that. There were no incentives to purchase this vehicle from Toyota. I know this because this is my wife's car. Uh, why were there no incentives? Well, law of supply and demand. Simply put, there's a shorter supply and a greater demand. Toyota's not trying to move these things. They got, the, they got the corner of the market. Well, at least for Priuses. Anyway, 
car drives well, um, but Toyota was not really interested in providing me with incentive to buy that vehicle because 55 miles per gallon is a pretty darn good incentive, you have to say. So economics of pollution control. Traditionally, most economies regard pollution as an externality. In other words, like with the Cuyahoga River fire that, that spawned the Clean Water Act in, uh, uh, in the 1970s, up until the time we made them pay attention to it, they ignored it. There was no reason for them to take that, uh, to treat that, that, that uh, raw uh, discharge into the Cuyahoga River that was going to burn eventually, uh, because nobody was making them do it. Um, so they ignored it and they made money uh, on the side and didn't have to worry about cleaning things up. I believe I said this in the last lecture, it costs a lot more to actually clean something up after it's contaminated than it does to prevent that pollution in the first place. So we get to that point in a minute. I'm going to make that point. I <laughs> kind of make that point for sure. In response to citizen complaints, because the citizens realized we don't like this. We don't like our rivers burning. We would like to be able to enjoy this. We can't really go down there. It, it's horrible, the stench and all that. Response to complaints, some governments established com com pollution control standards that then did this thing called internalizing the cost of industrial pollution. That's what happened in the case of the Clean Water Act. The first thing was to end that point source discharge to surface waters, to receiving water bodies. Basically, they took the cost of that and they plowed it, they, they made the people who were producing those gadgets or whatever it is they were building that was helping to produce that waste, they had to include that in the cost of building things. So the cost of things went up. Yes, the cost you pay for it, but we also ended up with a cleaner environment. And in the long run, it's going to be cheaper to do it that way than it is uh, the other way. So that cost-benefit analysis, pollution control. The goal is to maximize pollution control at minimum cost. How do you do that? By taking care of the pollution before it becomes pollution. Taking care of that waste stream before it gets outside of the confines of uh, your system, out of your factory. There are problems. It's the impossibility of quantifying certain costs and benefits. Economists want everything quantified, and they have to have it quantified. It's not their fault that that's how their business works or their, their jobs work. So our job as environmental scientists, uh, and, and that's just my day job also, is to try to quantify the benefit of doing a certain thing or the costs of doing it. Human life, pain and suffering, the aesthetic intrinsic values are hard to quantify. If not, they tend to be left out of the equation. They tend, and, and, they tend to be uh, left outside. They tend to be ignored, <laughs> to, put it, uh, to put it politely. It tends to be ignored. So who should actually pay for pollution control? Consumer. Well, that's who probably ultimately pays for most of it because it's baked in, if you will. It's built into the products we buy. The taxpayer also pays for it, particularly in terms of stormwater runoff, uh, the, the uh, trying to protect uh, public resources from uh, contamination from road runoff or whatever. Part of our the, uh, the money you pay to uh, put gas in your car, that is taxed. That tax goes to support the DOT's uh, stormwater treatment systems to a certain extent. The consumer, taxpayer, both bear the cost of pollution abatement. Uh, determining who should pay in a given situation is difficult and often controversial for sure. Pollution control does not always cost. Go back to my the thing I said in the previous slide. costs a lot more to clean it up than it does to prevent in the first place. It pays the, say, the polluter, should say potential polluter, all those direct and indirect repercussive costs, in other words, they have to go back and clean it up afterwards, particularly if they're found to be at fault under those laws we talked about in the last lecture. Repercussive costs of pollution, once they get figured in, it benefits the pollution generate, potential pollution generator to prevent that stuff on the front end. So an ecological perspective on what is wrong with economics, and, and some Economists would not agree there's anything wrong with economics. Well, uh, we're gonna, that, that's kind of just this point of view. We're going to talk through it, agree or disagree. In fact, this is also our coal mine picture, same coal mine. Economic short-sightedness. Need to adjust the supply and demand economics to include those ecological realities. How much is it actually going to cost 
to prevent that pollution from going into the air. This is, are scrubbers cost effective to remove pollutants? Or would it be better if we separated out what we're burning is causing this uh, contamination to go in the first place? But we don't, uh, we don't adjust those supply and demand eco economics to, to fit that. Another thing about economics is it's obsessed with growth. There you hear the stock market goes up and, and people are happy. Stock market goes down, people are sad. Uh, depends on who you are. But there's a major bias in our society and in Western society in general. Economic growth is always desirable. That is the bias. Tenet rests upon this frontier belief, the frontier mentality. We talked about frontier mentalities. Back, this was formed uh, in the, the 1800s, early 1800s, when America was just starting out and the, most of the continent was empty. Well, it was empty of white people. Um, so we, uh, we saw this as being completely open and uh, we could do whatever we wanted to. Always more of everything needed to fuel our growth. Well, that's not true anymore. The frontier closed, I believe, in uh, 1888 or sometime like that when they declared uh, the front. It didn't take very long for us to fill all that space in. Well. We haven't filled in all the space because some of the space simply won't support us very well, particularly out there in uh, the high desert and places like that. So this doctrine of growth requires an ever-expanding population, ever-increasing per capita consumption. So we have this population curve, keeps going up, just like that. Whew. It's unsustainable, both environmentally and as far as, is, is, uh, it's just not sustainable. We can't, we can't keep doing this. So, growth. Fundamental laws, flaws, laws, flaws of the gross GNP, gross national product. GNP, value neutral. It doesn't care whether you're wasteful remedies or whether it's something that's going to uh, enhance someone's life, uh, make their standard of living better, or, or that sort of a thing. It doesn't distinguish between wasteful uh, expenses or remedial expenses, as well as those contributing to standard of living improvement. There is a, another way of looking at it, just yet another acronym is wonderful. So you subtract all that waste, uh, remedial expenditures that you shouldn't have to, to expend um, from the gross national product, and you end up with this net economic welfare number, NEW. So more accurate measurement of how well the economy is servicing society. And the economies are supposed to service society, ultimately. Pollution and congestion, as they increase, the disparity between the gross national product and that net economic welfare number increases. So GNP may continue to rise, but that net economic welfare number will be stuck flat. GNP reflects all expenditures you ignoring that accumulated wealth that we already have out there uh, doesn't really inform us about any transition to being sustainable. And we, we need to, to, to reach that sustainable point because we are going to run out of resources. That's inevitable. So, is it environmental protection versus jobs? Eh. Nearly all the objective studies of this question show that, no, it's not the, the, the environment versus jobs. Uh, protecting the environment does not cost jobs. What costs jobs is automation and shifting demographics of where uh, the cost is, is uh, best for a, a business to uh, manufacture its uh, widgets. Uh, has little to do with environmental protections. Has more to do with local labor costs, but anyway. Environmental protection in the long run is more compatible with healthy economy and full employment than if we go through the, uh, well, I'll pollute and I'll pay for it later, the externality, not, not including the cost of pollution prevention in the cost of your widget. Environmental protection and jobs simply go together. I'll change kind of a little review uh, item. Learning about the natural world is the foundation of environmental science, environmental protection. We need to uh, really enjoy what we've got. So uh, this is a, a quote from Edward Abbey. Uh, Not enough to fight for the land, even more important to enjoy it. Yeah. Well, it's still there. Because it won't always, mountains always be there. Well, maybe in our lifetime, but not someone comes and, and builds some sort of a, 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 a huge edifice on it. 
get out there and mess around with the grizzlies, the gators in this part of the world, run the rivers, all those things, and enjoy that mysterious and awesome space. Environmental literacy is a policy aim from, well, a ways back, actually, 1990 is when the National Environmental Education Act was passed by Congress and identified environmental education, introduction to environmental science, hey, as a national priority. So, ACT has two broad goals. Number one is to improve public understanding of the environment. That's a part of why uh, we offer this course and I hope part of the reason that you took it. The second one is to encourage post-secondary students if you happen to be one of those after to graduate high school and you're interested in pursuing careers related to the environment, I'd be happy to talk with you because there are a lot of opportunities out there. There are certain things that you have to do, though, to make sure that you're ready for that. So environmental education really develops an ecological awareness. We talked about volunteer programs, two, two big ones in uh, the, this part of the world. Uh, the uh, Audubon uh, Christmas Counts, done by citizen scientists. Anyone can make authentic contributions to scientific knowledge through active learning and being a citizen scientist. Uh, one way, get involved with those science projects. The science projects, I say, Florida Lake Watch is citizen science. Audubon Bird Count, citizen science. There are a lot of opportunities. Uh, there's a place called Archibald Biological Station that would love to have people, they have volunteers all the time. They're looking for uh, some really cool things to do, and they do some really cool stuff down there. Ordinary people join with established scientists and actually answer real questions. <clears throat> or try to, sometimes realize, oh, there's not really a good answer to that, is there? No. So community-based research is pioneered in other nations, the Netherlands. We are trying to do more of that in this country. So how much is enough? Well, I'll know, I'll let you know when I get there. What's my one thing? That's a, an old uh, thing. What, what, what one more thing do I have to have where I have enough? Well, <clears throat> technology has made consumer goods and services cheap and readily available, mostly in richer countries. Everybody has to have their smartphone. The idea of conspicuous consumption, not, uh, not, not, a, not a positive idea, describes those things we just buy because we're trying to keep up with the Joneses. We don't really want them or need them. Some critics call this accelerated consumerism a disease affluenza. If you choose to consume less, it's an easy way to reduce that environmental footprint. Remember the footprint? And save money. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses. This is a little cartoon from Modern Man. Um, it says we need to consume so we can have jobs producing goods for consumption. Is shopping really our highest purpose? Well, some for, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Green buildings. This is an, a, an interesting idea. They uh, talked about the, the LEED process where you have an environmental uh, design uh, awards. There are no green buildings right yet, right now, yet at South Florida State College. But you can envision that in this part of the world, in Florida, the building would feature such things as photovoltaics to generate electricity. Generates his own electricity. A geothermal well. Why would you want a well? Well, because uh, the, the groundwater is at a very constant temperature and it's much more efficient to use that water, to pump that water up, and use that as a heat exchange to heat or cool the building. Heat and cool the building. I don't know why I put that bullet there, but I did. We would in this part of the world, reduce our southern exposure and increase that northern exposure so that you reduce the amount of sunlight that's coming in the building through, through windows and increase the amount that, of heat that's radiated out of the north side. And there's this idea of a living machine, kind of a wetland, if you will, for water treatment. So how do you reduce your impact? Well, I always purchase less, don't waste things, do you really need more stuff? Avoid buying things you don't need or won't use. Avoid trying to keep up with the Joneses or the Kardashians. Yeah, I had a conversation with uh, uh, one of my daughters about that. I think it was on an instant message system. She didn't know what the Joneses were. And uh, Anyway, it's like trying to keep up with the Kardashians. Maybe that's more relevant. I don't know. Use items as long as possible. Don't replace them just because a new product. Okay, like your smartphone. Gosh, i got to have the newest and latest version. No, you don't. 
as long as it'll update the software, you're probably going to be good. And yeah, um, so there are times when yes, you do have to, things do wear out, you replace those things, but you don't necessarily just have to go out and get the, the newest one, even though that's not what the markers tell us. You can, instead of purchasing books to read, which uses up paper, although a lot of us don't do that, particularly in this class, how many, how many books do you have to buy for this class? Uh, that'd be none. Um, but use the library instead of purchasing books or go online and download them. Audible's a great place. No paper involved. Reduce that excess packaging. I am horrible about doing this. I have all these reusable bags and they sit in the pantry. <laughs> they never make it in the car. Oh, help me. Uh, we're shopping refuse bags for small purchases. I do that. If I'm going in and I'm just getting uh, a, a, a gallon of milk, I'll be putting it back for you. No, I don't want a bag. I can carry it in my hand. All I'm going to do is throw the bag away. Actually, I don't throw them away. I try to recycle them. Ah. This sometimes works, buying items in bulk, minimal packaging. I mean, you can buy a, a, an entire gross of ramen noodles. Um, for me, that would be a lifetime supply because I don't eat ramen noodles. Uh, avoid single-serving foods. I think that's a very good idea. Choose that packaging that can be recycled or even reused, for sure. A few more. Things to reduce your impact. Avoid disposable items. Conserve energy. Walk or bicycle. Unfortunately, around here we don't have public transportation. Uh, don't turn on the lights unless you need to. Uh, don't just run the water while you're brushing your teeth. Turn it off. It doesn't take anything at all. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the winter, or during the, uh, the, the fall, winter, spring time period, if you want to call it that in, uh, in this part of the world, um, I'm quite fond of opening the house, uh, turning off the air conditioner, turning off the heater, and just letting uh, the, the, uh, the sun and the wind uh, maintain a temperature, a uh, constant temperature. And that works pretty well, unless it gets really cold, or the humidity climbs up, in which case you've got to close the house up. But... That's one of the things I like to do. It's something which I like to do. Put up clotheslines or racks to avoid using a clothes dryer. Yeah, that might work, as long as it's not raining all the time. Try to carpool. Try to reduce it. You actually have good conversations. Use water-saving devices all the time. From an earlier lecture, we learned about Teddy Roosevelt, the big stick. Remember, walk softly and carry a big stick. So what is sustainable development? Sustainable, to be sustained, and development, a step and stage in advancement. So, we're going to talk about sustainable development, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the future generations to meet their needs. This is way back, I'm not sure which earlier lecture this was. I want to say it was like number four. I could be wrong though. So, sustainable development is how we're going to improve or advance our culture. Sustainable challenges of sustainable development. We've been through a few of them. The economics of it are, are difficult. We don't have to be here for the long term. We don't plan on being here for the short term. We cannot deplete those natural systems we depend upon. All these things, food, water, energy, fiber, waste, disposal, all those things, all those services, natural services, come from these systems. We can't do without them, so we need to protect them. We need to sustain them, because we can't really rebuild them either. We can try. So there's some models for an integrating sustainable development. If you're looking globally, share the opportunity of sustainable development by improving people's lives in impoverished regions. It doesn't have to be an impoverished region in another country. There are plenty of them here. Est extend human well-being over many generations. Protect those natural resources for future generations. These benefits really, if they're going to be sustainable, they're going to last, they have to be available to everyone. So, goals of sustainable development. Are, are these realistic goals? And you may not be able to make this out, but this is actually the graph of human population growth over time, and it's gone up like that. See that? This is 6 billion, um, 500,000 years, approximately. You can kind of see that. So, stable world population. Demographic transition to low death rates. That's one goal. Can we get to that point? Can we stabilize our human population? We may have, we're going to have to eventually, but how do you do that? That's a goal. Probably a realistic one. Energy transition. 
Ready to drive Priuses? You need to do better than that. Um, high efficiency production use, increasing reliance on renewable resources. And renewable resources, use those renewable resources in ways that they're not being used up. Economic transition, sustainable development as a broader sharing of its benefits. That's a very vague one, but that's one of their goals. And then this last one is very controversial, especially uh, in uh, the current climate. Um, sustainable development would have us go to a more global system. In other words, grounded in complementary interests, because there's all kinds of complementary interests all around the world that can work together to actually provide services uh, locally and also help those in uh, far-flung parts of the world. And we are far-flung part of the world for some folks. Um, negotiate those those uh, those those understandings between all those places. Very controversial because there, uh, there's a lot going on with that. We have to protect the needs of future generations, like that little guy there. If we're not doing that, what are we doing, really? So, have you been introduced to environmental science? Maybe a little bit. Started out with uh, Paul Ehrlich's quotes, Stanford University. So what is the first rule of intelligent tinkering? It's at the bottom, the question is at the bottom of every one of my slides. Uh, the answer is save all the parts. Save all the parts. It sounds simple now, um, maybe it isn't. In the end, and I guess this is something I was going to talk about, but I never did um, get to it, but uh, we have uh, a, an image of the Nassan Glacier in Antarctica calving, forming a new glacier. See it, basically there's an ice tongue that's going out and they're producing new glaciers. Producing them faster than they used to because um, the Nassan Glacier is actually uh, melting. In this class you have traveled the world in a virtual manner. Been to Challenger Deep. Challenger Deep where is that? The Marianas. 10,000 meters deep. Very deep place. Only a handful, oh, no, less than a handful of, of, of people have ever seen Challenger or been to the bottom of Challenger Deep. 10,000 meters a long way down. So I traveled to Easter Island. A lot of other places in between. Easter Island where the uh, natives, well, pretty much uh, they uh, destroyed the uh, ecology of the island and ended up eating rats. So there's that. So, a couple of pop quizzes. Where does the Nashville Warbler get its name? Well, probably from Nashville. <laughs> it's kind of a pop question, pop quiz. It was a trick question. And this one, there's some interesting, if you did the pop quizzes, remember these pop quizzes, there are uh, a few pop quiz assignments open for Unit 6. Um, the pop quiz assignments, those, those points go directly to your unit test grade. They're added on top. Talk more about that in just a minute. So they're worth doing. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything not to do them. On the other hand, if you do them, you, you can actually uh, improve that unit test grade, which is 30% of your total grade. So we wrap up with this. Buckminster Fuller calls this Spaceship Earth. We're not going to get another spaceship, so how do we make this one work? Another great quote from Marshall McLean. No passengers, we're all crew, and we're stewards. That's kind of my, if I could uh, use one word to sum up how I feel about uh, uh, environmental science. It uh, shows us how important our stewardship is, and that we're uh, in the driver's seat as far as uh, degrading large portions of the environment, and hopefully in righting that ship, so to speak. So what we talked about today in this lecture. Ask the question, what is environmental sustainability? Talked about Amendment 1. That doesn't even look like Amendment 1, does it? Let me erase that. Oops. I'll oh, come back here. There we go. Wrong button. I haven't done that in a while. There we go. Amendment 1. No, nope. now it's not going to give me uh, color. Uh, it's always good to... Uh, mess with things. There at the very end. Hey, why not, right? Amendment 1. Trade-offs. 
the economy versus the environment. And what's wrong with economics? We went through several things about externalizing and internalizing certain costs. The value of learning about the natural world, reducing our impacts, what are the goals of sustainable development? Some of those are controversial. And a brief course review. Oh, come on. References, also see the annotations in the previous slides. Uh, two books, primary source for this, uh, this, article, this lecture actually came from Principles of Environmental Science from Cunningham and Cunningham. And I like to say this, it's all over but the shouting. That's my favorite slide right there. And these guys are all um, shouting, barking, uh, making a happy sound because class is over. Um, note about the unit tests. Uh, there are, are six of them in this particular uh, course. Only the top five are counted towards your final grade. And the lowest score is dropped. And I just pick whatever the lowest one is and I drop that particular score. Um, that's why those extra credit points are so important because they add directly on top of whatever that, uh, that final score is. I just add that in and then we figure your, your grade based on that. So it's been good having you in class and I hope that uh, you have, uh, can take some positive things away from Introduction to Environmental Science.